good afternoon. How's everybody doing today? Today, what we are going to be talking about is the left brain advantage in conquering self-doubt and imposter syndrome. The left brainer. Now, you may or may not be a natural left brainer, but it doesn't matter. You can employ your left brain when it comes to overcoming this challenge. And we've all got it. It is as common as you can imagine. So let's dive into this, shall we? What's the problem? What is exactly the problem that we're trying to deal with? I mean, let's face it, you're smart as hell, right? You, you, you were the smartest kid in the class, maybe the second smartest kid in the class. Maybe you loved math. Maybe you loved science. Maybe you didn't. doesn't matter. But the fact is you're smart. But now... Now, here it is, you're, you know, you're well into your career, you may, you know, you've finished school, you've been working a few years, maybe you've been working more than a few years. Why is it, at this point in your life, you know, when you've accomplished so much, why is it that you are doubting yourself? Why is it that you're questioning your right to be in the room? Why are you looking around and thinking, wow, uh, you know, all these people are so much smarter than me. These people are so much more accomplished than me. I hope they don't find me out. I hope that they don't, uh, you know, start asking questions about me and uh, uh, and wondering why I'm here. What if I, you know, what right do I have to be here? That's what imposter syndrome shows up at. That's what self doubt shows up as. But uh, you know, the, here's, the, here's the irony of it is, you know, we, we look around and think, I don't belong here. I, I, I'm not one of this crowd. But the very fact that you are feeling imposter syndrome makes you one of the crowd because statistically, this is a mental situation, a mental circumstance that affects as many as 80 or 85 percent of the general population. So if you look around you, you know, if you're riding the bus or you're walking down the street or you're driving along the street. Look around you and see 10 people. Eight of them are feeling that same self-doubt, that same imposter syndrome as you are. So, you know, it, this is not something you, you're not you're not unique that way. You're not um, uh, all by yourself in that way. Tell you, you know, let, let's post it right there in the comments, shall we? Let's post it in the comments. Put your hand up if you occasionally or frequently feel like an imposter. You know, say, yes, that's me. Put it in there because I know I have in the past. I've felt that way. And it likes to sneak up on you as well. So what we're about here today is to learn how it is that if you are a card-carrying left-brainer or if you have, you know, you're sufficiently familiar with this left-right brain business, how you can leverage that left brain of yours to conquer it and not just cover over the symptoms, but I'm saying conquer it, put it behind you for good. You can absolutely do that. Now, but before we dive into how you can do that, let's talk a little bit more about, you know, what it might do be doing for you. Is there any advantage to self-doubt and imposter syndrome? Well, actually, not that I've ever been able to find out. There are, and then, in fact, there are four, count them, four major disadvantages to feeling imposter syndrome and feeling self-doubt. First of all, it feels awful. You know, this is not a pleasant emotion. It's not a pleasant mental state when you are feeling inadequate, when you're feeling less than deserving, when you're feeling like you don't belong. It just feels awful. It's a nasty human emotion that we could just, you know, much prefer to not have to deal with. Number two, what does it accomplish? It accomplishes nothing. You know, what, what problem have you ever solved because you were doubting yourself? Uh, how have you ever moved forward and accomplished more because you were doubting yourself or because you felt like an imposter? No, what happens is we pull back. You know, it, it doesn't solve a problem. You know, you say, well, I've got this problem. I'm feeling like I can't do this thing. Well, that's not how you go about solving problems now, is it? So the third thing. If you let it hang around long enough, it's going to make you sick because these kinds of uh, these kinds of anxieties 
if you leave them there for a long period of time, they can literally manifest as all kinds of sicknesses and disease and, you know, just ailments, uh, you know, from uh, high blood pressure and, uh, you know, just stiffness and uh, headaches, all kinds of things. There's a long list of problems that happen when you are allowing worry and anxiety, which is a you know, it's a one way that self-doubt and, and imposter syndrome, they, you're actually worried about something. I'm worried that these people are going to uh, catch on to me. I'm worried that I'm not going to be good enough. And finally, the fourth disadvantage of this is that it limits your potential, doesn't it? Uh, you know, what you can accomplish, what you can achieve, what you believe about yourself becomes so much less when you are feeling these uh, these experiences, when you're feeling self-doubting, when you are feeling like that fraud, you don't try, you, know, you don't step up, you don't say, yes, I can accomplish this, and not only can I accomplish this, I can accomplish this as well. No, you don't do that. You pull back, don't you? You lower your expectations. You reduce your dreams. You shrink your dreams. And that's not how we want to go through life. So the truth is we're a whole lot better without these things, wouldn't we? Now, how do we, how are we typically um, advised? You know, because it's so common. People say, I'm feeling this. What should I do about it? Um, well, the traditional approaches to helping you with this focus on trying to fix something that is wrong with you. You know, immediately it says, oh, oh, that's a problem. There's something wrong with you if you're feeling this. Uh, let's just pile on, shall we? Yeah, let, great. I was feeling bad enough. Now you're telling me that I've got some kind of a mental illness or I've got some kind of a problem in my thinking process that we have to fix. No, 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 no. The, no, there's nothing wrong with you at all. And that, you know, that's the, that's the approach we want to take. It's not we're trying to fix something wrong. It's just we're trying to show you that they, you are absolutely amazing, that you can accomplish so much. We're just trying to remove burdens from you. That's all we're trying to do. We're not trying to turn you into something you're not. We're just going to remove those burdens like you're walking around carrying this 50-pound bag of rocks. Well, let me take that off your shoulders for you and watch how fast you can then run when you're not carrying that load anymore. That's how we want to feel. Traditional approaches to solving these kinds of things, they focus on covering up the symptoms. And, you know, it's kind of like, uh, you know, well, I've got a headache. Okay, great. Take a Tylenol. That's great, but it, you know, it makes the headache go away, but it does not solve you know, what was causing the headache in the first place. Wouldn't it be so much better if in just, in, you know, instead of dulling our nerve endings, we were to find the, the root cause and get rid of it. Well, that's what we're going to do when we get rid of our self-doubt and imposter syndrome. We're not just going to try and butter over the, the symptoms and cover those up. No, we're going to tear it up by the roots. We're going to heal this. We're going to make it go away permanently. But it's fun to look at these, uh, you know, the advice that is out there. Uh, if you were to Google, how do I get over self-doubt? How do I get over imposter syndrome? If you Google that, which I did just for fun, uh, there's 10 things, 10 pieces of advice that, are, that they give you. Uh, I'll run down them for you because some of them are, I mean, yeah, it's what people work with. But when we shine a bright light on it, we think, we scratch our head and say, excuse me, what? How's this going to help? Number one, practice self-compassion. Well, that's a great idea. I think we're, we are all way too hard on ourselves. But what exactly does that mean? How do, does that mean I sit around feeling sorry for myself? Does that mean that I say, no, I'm not even going to try. I'm just going to lay on the couch all day and watch soaps. <laughs> no, that's not going to help us at all. It might help you in the moment. And yes, self-compassion is a very, very good thing to learn how to practice. But to just say that, practice self-compassion, that's not much help at all. Number two, remember your past achievements. 
Yeah, that's actually a really good one too. But you need some coaching on that. What how what does this mean? My past achievements because you know that saying, you know, uh, what have you done for me lately? I can spend all day long thinking about I did this and I did this, but it's today that I'm feeling I'm not up to doing that. So re recalling my past achievements unless I've learned how to channel that and how to leverage that um, it's not going to be a whole lot of help. Number three, I love this one. Try to not compare yourself to others. <laughs> yeah, I love that one. Try. I love that word. Try. Try to not compare yourself to others. That's kind of like saying, all right, try not to think of pink elephants. And what does that do to you? Instantly, what have you got in your mind? You got this picture of pink elephants. And as soon as I say, try not to compare yourself to others, what are you doing? You know, it's auto-suggestion. Immediately, you're comparing yourself to others. Don't compare myself to others. Don't compare myself to others. Well, that doesn't work either. Number four, be mindful of your thinking. That means pay attention to your thoughts. Be self-aware. Yeah, that's good. I'm aware that I'm really in doubt about myself. I'm aware that I feel like a fraud in this room full of really smart people. Okay, what do I, where do I take it from there? Number five, spend time with supportive people. Yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, I kind of prefer the opposite of that, though, the opposite approach, which is I, what I like to call um, quit the complaining club, right? Hanging around with all the people that are pulling you down and saying, oh, this is hard, and oh, that's hard, and oh, I'm never going to make it, and the world is really awful. I don't want to hang out with those people at all. Sorry, I've got this barrier around my mind and I only let really great stuff in it. So, yeah, spending time with supportive people, that's a really good idea. Who are those supportive people? But how do we keep them from making us, uh, prevent them from making us feel even more uh, like an imposter? Number six, find validation from within. Hmm? From within here? Well, that's where all the self-doubt is, isn't it? That's where the self-doubt is living, and that's where the imposter lives. And how do I find validation? The only validation that's coming from within there is that, yes, you're a fraud. Now, again, these pieces of advice are actually very good, but they need to go a little deeper than that. Number seven, remember that you are your own harshest critic. Yeah, you're right. I am, and I'm the one that knows me best, and I know that I shouldn't be here, and I don't deserve to be here, and all these other people are smarter than me, and I'm never going to make it. Right? We got to find ways to shut that off. Just remembering it. Yeah, I remember, and yeah, this critic has got a lot of criticism for me. Number eight, identify your values. Um, not entirely sure what to do with that one. Uh, how does that help me stop being a fraud or an imposter? Number nine, keep a journal. And actually, that's a really good piece of advice. But again, uh, we need to go a little deeper. And oh, just by the way, if this is something that you're interested in, I, I actually have, uh, and it's available for free. It's a PDF download, and it is called The Left Brainer's Guide to Anti-Anxiety Journaling. And it really wise 17 page guide that walks you through the journaling process so that you actually can make this work for you. So if you want a copy of it, please DM me right here uh, on Facebook. You can get in touch with me. Say, hey, I would love a copy of that journal, that anti-anxiety journaling guide. Send me a DM. I will get one to you right away. And then number 10, number 10 piece of advice, traditional advice, uh, you know, um, traditional approaches. If all those other nine didn't work for you, number 10, seek professional help. <laughs> I love that. All right. You know, none of this other stuff is going to work for you. So go pay a therapist and maybe, you know, and then you can get better. Now, I am not disparaging uh, professional help. There are a lot of people that need it and a lot of, and it is enormously useful. But self-doubt and imposter syndrome, if you want to employ your left brain to overcome this, it is absolutely possible for you to just decide to get rid of it completely by leveraging that powerful logic, that powerful reasoning ability that you have. It is entirely possible to get rid of it. Now, but you know, that why do we want to get rid of it again? 
Well, that questioning, that self-doubt, all these things that are going along, these are huge obstacles to your success because as long as they're there, as long as that's what's going on in your mind, that is holding you back from reaching your highest potential and beyond your highest potential because you haven't even begun to understand your highest potential. It is so far beyond your imagining. But as long as that self-doubt, that 50-pound bag of rocks of imposter syndrome is on your back and you're carrying it around, you're not going to get anywhere. You have ambitious plans. You, you want to go places, don't you? You really want to accomplish things. And you don't have time or tolerance for irrational obstacles like self-doubt and imposter syndrome. And that's what they are. They are completely and utterly irrational because none of them are true. You know, they're thoughts that you have, but those thoughts are not true. That's one thing that we, we, learn, we learn in this process is we learn that your thoughts are not always trustworthy. You know, they pop up in our head and we instantly believe them. That's not, that's not a, a smart thing to do. <laughs> you know, have you ever had a couple of glasses of wine too many? And, you know, the things you say and the things you think in that situation, um, you know, the next morning you think, oh, what was I thinking? Exactly. What were you thinking? It certainly wasn't the truth. It certainly wasn't your truth. Or have you ever been, you know, highly emotional, either really, really angry or really, really joyful or whatever? You know, our, our thoughts in those instances aren't necessarily trustworthy either. And later when we calm down, then we, you know, we get back to even keel and we can be a little bit more rational, can't we? And that's the secret that we're going to be uncovering here is self-doubt and imposter syndrome. They are quite irrational because the truth is that you are incredibly capable. And yes, you do belong there in that room because the fact is you're there. If you didn't belong, you wouldn't be there. But it's these irrational thoughts that are going through your head. And that's why we want to leverage our left brain thinker, the left brain logic, the left brain rational reasoning ability to overcome this decidedly right brain challenge. That's what we're going to put to work. So let's dive in, shall we? And, and figure out, let's look at this. What does the advantage that the left brainer brings to this situation? Well, one of the things, you know, and, and we can make all kinds of jokes about left brainers in tech and left brainers in engineering and all the rest of it. And they're just, <laughs> they're wonderful, amazing people. And they are so good. And one of the strengths that people in tech, in science, in engineering, in math, is what one of the advantages that they have is they use this, the scientific method. The scientific method, that is a, a method whereby we take a subject that we want to learn more about and we examine it, we measure it, we analyze it. We're like scientists in a laboratory. We're looking at this thing under the microscope. Now, if this thing is some amoeba or a bacteria or something like that, or if this thing is some, you know, uh, a galaxy, you know, millions of light years away. We apply the same technique. We apply the same scientific method. We look at it. We examine it. We measure it. We observe it. We analyze it. We learn everything that there is to know about it. And then we decide, we make some conclusions about that, don't we? Unfortunately, with self-doubt and imposter syndrome, because they are so present and because they're irrational, we tend not to use rational thinking about them. And therefore, they defeat us. Now, the second advantage that the left-brainers have is something called the Socratic method. You remember Socrates, this guy, you know, back in ancient Greece, well, he developed this method of reasoning. And basically, it was built around asking, probing questions that are designed to uncover the truth. So, you know, they, he would ask questions. And in um, when Plato wrote the dialogues, he talked about Socrates and said, here are the questions 
that we would ask in order to get to the truth about a particular thing that we're wanting to uh, that we're wanting to study. Now, as scientists in a laboratory, we tend to study things. Again, you know, whether it's amoebas or viruses or whether it's galaxies or whether whatever it is, it doesn't matter. That's how we use the scientific method to study it. And if we are philosophers, we use the Socratic method and we ask probing questions and test them, test hypotheses. Does this work? Does this make sense? Does this hold up under argument and scrutiny? And that's why, that's how we're going to take our left brain and apply it to our self-doubt and imposter syndrome. It's wonderful because having applied that and having analyzed and studied and measured and having asked probing questions about it and gotten a bunch of answers, then we get to decide what, if anything, we want to do about it. It's only after studying, it's only after analyzing and learning what it is that we have here that we can then say, all right, now I know what this is. Now I can do something about it. Then we can use tools to, to decide what we want to do with about it. So the very first question, the very first analysis that we need to ask ourselves is, is this serving me? Is self-doubt is imposter syndrome, is that serving me in a beneficial way? Is my life, is my career, is my mood, is my health, is my relationships? Are all those things better off because of self-doubt and imposter syndrome? We have to ask that question. We have to ask, you know, and maybe the answer is obvious to you, but it may not be. Because if the answer is, yes, I feel better off with these things present, then great, just carry on. No action is required whatsoever. And we'll stop worrying about it. We'll stop complaining about it. Because we have concluded after studying it that, yep, I'm better off with this. And you know, that's not as um, unusual as it might seem. There are plenty of people who decide that, uh, you know, through with various anxieties or whatever, that they enjoy the sympathy that it gets them. They enjoy the drama in their life that it brings. They enjoy the attention that they get. And so you might ask that person and say, are you better off? And they say, yes, I'm better off with it. I like my life the way it is. Great. Stick with it. Hang in there and don't change a thing. Perfectly reasonable, logical, left brain kind of conclusion to reach. But if you say, no, I am not, it is not serving me. I am not better off with these things in my life. I would be a whole lot better if I didn't have imposter syndrome. And if I didn't have self-doubt in my life, then you know, it, it's, it's one of these logic diagrams, you know, one of those if-then kind of, kind of things um, that left-brainers love. You know, we go, you know, if yes, uh, do nothing. If no, proceed to step two. It's very, very straightforward. And it's reliable. I love it this way. So what is step two? If we decide, yes, you know, I, my, I am, it is not serving me. I do want to get rid of it, then we move on to step two. And the question we ask in step two is, what exactly is this self-doubt and imposter syndrome? Let's study it. Let's, I, I again, let me go back to this scientific method. I always like to use the um, metaphor, I'm, I'm a scientist in a laboratory. I've got this white lab coat on and I've got this blob of self-doubt. I've got this blob of imposter syndrome sitting on my laboratory bench and I'm going to study it. I'm going to dissect it. I'm going to measure it. I'm going to weigh it. I'm going to take its temperature. I'm going to look at it under a microscope and find out what it really is. And when we do that, we'll cut to the, we'll cut to the results here. What, what we, when we do that, what we discover is that self-doubt and imposter syndrome are one of the many, many different forms or manifestations of fear. 
at the end of the day, we have perceived some kind of a threat. That's what fear is. We perceive some kind of a threat and we need to react to that. We need to protect ourselves in some kind of a way. Now, you know, here we are in the 21st century. We're almost, you know, we're almost a quarter of the way through the 21st century. Isn't that incredible? But here we are incredibly evolved. We've got all this amazing technology available to us and amazing science. And yet, we stuck with our million-year-old biology and it still behaves like the million-year-old because what happens when we perceive a threat when our senses eyes ears whatever perceive that there is a threat of some sort coming at us some kind of uh you know we are uh, our life our, our well-being is somehow being threatened our biology is designed to respond. Now, a million years ago, when there were saber-toothed tigers jumping out in the woods and decided wanting to have you for lunch, then our body responded. And how does it respond? Well, it, it responds by pumping adrenaline, cortisol, into our systems. Those hormones are designed to prime us for action, prime us to take action right away they actually speed up our heart our heart rate they speed up our breathing they process oxygen more efficiently they actually strengthen our muscles because we are ready for that what fight or flight or freeze those are the responses aren't they and uh that's a really good thing because it kept us alive for all these millennia that we've been around so that's a wonderful thing. Our biology is there. But here's the deal. And here's the, where it gets important when we're thinking about self-doubt and imposter syndrome. There are all kinds of different threats to us, right? A threat of, you know, an oncoming bus or, uh, you know, a power line that's fallen down or whatever. You know, these things can actually kill you. And that's where the biology is really useful. But there are other threats that are more vague or off in the future somewhere and we're not you know we're not really quite understanding and that's where self-doubt and imposter syndrome fall under that category of more vague threats i vaguely believe that i'm doubting myself i'm not going to be i don't think i can do this i don't think i'm up to it now we never quite finish that sentence because it stays vague but if we were to finish it and say I, here's what i'm afraid is going to happen then it could be things like i'm going to be found out and i'll lose my job or i'll be embarrassed in front of my friends and then i'll be uh tossed out of this social circle you know there's all kinds of things that can happen but when these threats that we have and threats these days are things like you know your friend didn't like your facebook post and I feel, uh, you know, I feel threatened in some kind of a way. So the, here's the deal, though. When we're threatened, whether it is a life-threatening situation, like a bus coming at you and it's about to flatten you, or it's now I'm feeling, you know, like I don't belong in this room, those are very, very different threats, but your body can't tell the difference our million year old biology perceives them you know it just says oh threat quick respond go into red alert mode and what is red alert mode red alert mode is pump that cortisol pump that adrenaline in there you know get on get on high alert prep yourself for action now if there's a bus coming great there's something you can do you jump out of the way Whew. and those those uh dangers are very short-lived aren't they? Either the bus flattens you and you're dead, or you've jumped back to the sidewalk and you're fine. Either way, the threat is over. Whew, and now we can settle back down and the, you know, the hormones flush out of your system and your heart rate goes back down and you're fine. But when those threats are more vague or far off, or we're not quite sure exactly what they are, we stay on that red alert status, don't we? Our body stays there because it's still perceiving a threat and it's saying, I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready, but it doesn't know what it's ready for. It doesn't know what action to take. So when these threats are vague and undefined, 
we get this sustained red alert status, and that is incredibly unhealthy. And that's what can turn out to make us sick, right? Uh, you know, when you have cortisol in your system for sustained periods of time, that's nasty stuff, and it does not help your long-term health. So that's, you know, when we ask that question, what exactly is self-doubt and imposter syndrome? We have to recognize it's a form of fear. It's a subset, if you want, of fear. And it, um, it's one of those more vague ones. And yet we respond in that same kind of a way. So now that we know what it is, and of course we can dive much deeper into that, more, more analysis, but we've got a short period of time here. We move on to the next question, and that is, how did it get here? How did this self-doubt and imposter syndrome get here? That's a really important question to have. Well, again, let's go back into the laboratory, and what we discover is you were not born worrying. You know, here's an interesting fact. Infants, newborns, arrive pre-programmed with two and only two fears. One, they're afraid of loud noises, and number two, they're afraid of falling. That's it. Those are built into the system. <laughs> they're pre-programmed that way. Everything else that we are afraid of, we have learned or been conditioned about. Everything else we've been, we've, we've been trained or we've been uh, conditioned in some kind of a way to add that and say, oh, I've now, now, I now know that I'm supposed to be afraid of that. And think about it. You know, when you were, um, back when you were six years old and you were walking to school and your parents said, you know, don't talk to strangers, stranger danger. Okay, that's, that's uh, when you're six years old, that's a legitimate warning. You know, some guy in a van offering you candy. That's a good thing to stay away from when you're six years old. But if you are 26 or 46 or 76 and you're still nervous about talking to strangers, well, that's kind of a problem, isn't it? And But that's how it got here. We were trained to worry. You know, we were trained, given all kinds of training. You know, you were trained to... Um, uh, to not do this, do that, do this, don't do that. And there were all big set of rules and the, the you know, the consequences of, of breaking those rules. Uh, don't do that. You know, you keep that up, your hand will turn green and fall off. Um, there's all kinds of things that we were warned about and we were taught that the world is a scary place. We were taught that the world is a dangerous place and you have to be constantly on your guard. We were trained that way. And now we live in a world that is designed to sustain that worry, designed to make us nervous. I mean, just look at the 24-7 news, uh, news feeds out there. You can't walk through an airport without it being you know, blasted right at you. You can't get away from it. And it's not like, here's what's happening in a factual way. It's, here's what you need to know right now. Ah, And the world is falling apart. And... Uh, Yes, there's bad stuff goes on, but there's some really great stuff that goes on in the world too. But the news media is uh, trying to sell eyeballs on screens because that's what their advertisers pay them for. And uh, they do that with drama and they do that with danger and they do that with you know, breaking news. And so we're, constant, again, all, always on the edge in that vague red alert mode that we're not quite sure what to do with it. And that fosters the self-doubt and imposter syndrome. How else did it get here? Well, again, going back to our million-year biology, um, we humans are wired with this thing called a negativity bias. And again, it comes from millions of years ago when there was a whole lot of stuff that was going to eat you in the world. These days, the number of things in the world that on a daily basis for you and me that will actually kill you or really, really hurt you are very, very few. And yet, we have this negativity bias from a million, a year, a million years ago that ha builds into our brain, you know, if we hear a noise, <gasps> uh-oh, what's that? Uh, you know, if there's a knock at the door, our thoughts are immediately, oh, oh, what's wrong? I wasn't expecting anybody. And we all, you know, we go to that. What's the worst that could happen? Why don't we ever say, what's the best that could happen? 
It's because of this negativity bias. It might be the publisher's clearinghouse showing up with your check, all right? But we don't go there. We don't tend to go there because of this negativity bias. Now, that is part of our biology, but you know we're a million years on now, and we're really smart. We've got this incredibly developed left brain, and we can override those instincts. We can train ourselves to respond in a very positive way. So that's question number three. How did it get here? Well, that's how it got here. We live in a world designed to make us nervous. We were trained to worry, and we've got this negativity bias. So that gets to question number four in our scientific method, our Socratic questioning method. And the question is, why can't I make it stop? I don't like it. I don't want it. I want to stop. Yeah, it's like I said, you know, stop thinking about pink elephants. <laughs> yeah, right. That's going to work. And of course, now all you've got in your head is pink elephants. Well, here's the deal. You have been doing this for so long. We've all been doing this for so long, right from childhood when we were trained. It has become a mental habit. That's it. You know, it's like any other habit. Uh, you know, if you have a habit of biting your nails, um, you, you're not even aware that you're doing it. It drops below your level of conscious awareness. Any habit does. And this habit of self-doubt, this habit of imposter syndrome, has become a mental habit. And you're not even aware that you're doing it. It's just suddenly there and suddenly you think, oh, wow, there I am worrying again. And so it's hard to make it stop when we're not even aware that it's going on. And because it happens so much, because it's a habit, and because so many people around us, remember what I said, 80 to 85 percent, also do it, it appears to be normal. I look around and say, well, everybody does it. I do it. I do it all the time. I guess it's normal. I guess it's just a natural state. Oh, well, I'll just live with it. But it is not a natural state. It is not something. It is a mental habit that you've just been doing so long, and so many people have been doing so long. It appears to be normal. Normal is an interesting word, you know, normal. It's normal to have potholes in the road. It's normal to have racial bias. It's normal to have, um, uh, well, you know, wars. But does that mean it's good? There's a lot of really smart people working really hard to get rid of these things. And it's the same with your self-doubt and imposter syndrome. We can get rid of them. It, you know, just because it's normal does not mean it's also desirable. We can get rid of it. But, you know, the, the, why is it hard to get rid of it? Because, why can't I make it stop? Because, you know, everybody's doing it. I've been doing it forever. Therefore, it must be normal. Therefore, I can't do anything about it. Well, let's use our left brains and challenge that. And one of the very first uh, devices that we use is what we call a pattern interrupt. We interrupt the pattern of that thinking. We stop it in its tracks. It's like falling dominoes. You know, you've ever watched those dominoes? Those fun, I think it's fun to go on YouTube and watch, and they go for 20 minutes going around and around on these thousands and thousands of dominoes falling, falling. And it's great fun to watch, but all you need to do is stick your hand in front of one of them, and the whole thing stops. And that's what we can do with these mental habits. We interrupt that pattern. And of course, you know, in our audacity method, I'll show you how to do that exactly. But now that we've asked some questions about it, what have we asked? Let's review the questions we've asked. Number one, is it serving me? Number two, what is it exactly? What is this thing? And we found out that it's a subset of fear. We said, you know, no, it's not serving me. I'm better off without it. What is it exactly? It's a subset of fear. And we learn how that operates. Number three, how did it get here? Well, you were trained. The world reinforces it constantly. And we've got this negativity bias. So that led to number four, which is why can't I make it stop? Because it just became a habit over years and years and years and years of your growing up and watching everybody else around it, guess it's normal. So I just carry on, never thought about trying to stop it. But now we can. So that leads us to question number five, which is what, if anything, do I want to do about it? Remember our first question, is it serving me? 
And we said, yeah, I would like to stop it. What can I do about it? Well, we have discovered that self-doubt and imposter syndrome are nothing but mental habits. That's, what the, that's all they are. They are entirely self-imposed because our thoughts are up to us. Now, they're the hardest thing to control, but we can control them. We can learn to control them. And like any habit, mental habit, physical habit, it can, we can stop it by replacing it. We can choose to do that. Like any habit, it, this self-doubt, imposter syndrome, comes with an off switch. We can turn that off switch if we want to. That's the beauty of the left brain approach, is that if we decide we'd like to stop it, we can at any time. Now, it takes a little bit. There's a few steps involved, three in matter of fact. And, uh, you know, on future live streams, we're going to be talking about those three methods. Mostly what I wanted you to do today is to realize that by using my left brain, I can use that left brain logic, that use that left brain rationale, that left brain reasoning process to tackle this right brain challenge that I've got. Because typically we've been trying to solve the right brain uh, challenge with the right brain approach, and it doesn't work. So, you know, yin and yang, fire with water. Let's, let's uh, you know, use a different approach to solve it. So, what should you do right now? As we're getting to the wrap up here, what should you do right now? Well, number one, ask yourself that very first question. Is this serving me? Is my self-doubt, is my imposter syndrome serving me? Is my life better off because these things are here with me? These mental habits. Because I've got these mental habits, I've perfected them. Oh, man, am I good at them. Okay, because you're so good at this skill, you've perfected, you've mastered this skill. Is your life better off as a result? Again, if yes, God bless you. Carry on. Keep doing it. Get better at it if you want. But if you say no, if you say no, I would be better off without them, what should you do? Well, there is a three-step method. Well, you know, we can go to the Google there and you can uh, practice self-compassion and you can uh, uh, try not to compare yourself to others and all that's great stuff, which mm, doesn't work very well. But there is a three-step science-backed process that I've called the, the audacity method. And uh, how, did, how did it develop? Well, it came because I suffered from the same thing. I went through exactly the same process, and you know, to me, it just got so carried away, I l landed myself literally homeless for a few months way back in 2009. And I said, okay, enough of this. I'm too smart for this. I'm going to figure this out. And I did. And I went out and I spent all these questions, you know, taking the scientific approach. That's what I did. And over a couple of years, I learned all this about anxiety and self-doubt and imposter syndrome. And I applied it, developed this method that I now call the audacity method. And it's all backed by science stuff. And uh, it works. It works to completely remove self-doubt and imposter syndrome. And that's what I talk about here on in the Facebook group, the I Fearless Facebook group. I talk, if you want to follow me on LinkedIn, if you want to follow me on Instagram, you can find all the connections here. Um, and if you want to find out more, and as I said, I'm in future Facebook Live events, uh, I'm going to be talking about these, this three-step method. But if you're in a hurry, and you'd really like to get going with that now, then please reach out to me. Let's talk. We can figure this out. I just want to remind you also about that um, Left Brainer's Guide to Anti-Anxiety Journaling, a fabulous tool that you have absolutely free. DM me and say, I want a copy of that guide, and I'll, I'll get it to you right away because uh, we want to put a stop to this, and these are tools that we can use for that. And yes, journaling is part of the process that we use for breaking this habit. 
using our left brain powers of logic and reason to overcome this incredibly challenging and annoying and not the least bit useful right brain problem. And with that, I want to say thank you so much to you for being here with me today. I love chatting about this stuff. I love sharing these ideas. I love helping people get rid of that and moving on. Throwing that 50-pound bag of rocks off and saying, forget it. I don't need that anymore. So that's it for now. Please join me again here in another Facebook Live event and uh, follow me on Instagram, on LinkedIn, uh, here on Facebook, and we will dump this self-doubt and this anxiety and this imposter syndrome. All right, guys, I'm David. I'll see you another time soon.